Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to, from me to the House of Worship today. Um, when Lou originally asked me if I'd like to um, speak today, uh, I didn't, neither he nor I knew that it was actually the week of prayer at that stage. Um, however, we do, so uh, rather than pass it over, I'm going to uh, share a few of the key thoughts from the week of prayer reading with you and uh, then we'll, we will have another prayer. I'm going to ask um, Brother David and Brother Lou to come up and uh, say prayer on behalf of the congregation uh, for us, all of us, including me. So uh, following Christ's method is the uh, the reading that's been prepared, it's appropriate that it's written by Ellen White. And um, yeah, so she says that true success, the key to true success, I'm sorry, uh, Christ's methods alone will give us true success in reaching the people. The Saviour mingled with men as one who desired their good. He, he showed his sympathy for, the, for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. She goes on to say, There is need of coming close to the people by personal effort. If less time were given to sermonising, <laughs> that's what we're doing now, if time, less time were given to sermonising and more time was spent in personal ministry, Greater results would be seen. The poor are to be relieved, the sick cared for, the sorrowing and the bereaved comforted, the ignorant instructed, the inexperienced counselled. We are to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice, accompanied by the power of persuasion, the power of prayer, the power of the love of God. This work will not cannot be without fruit. Amazing words. I trust that um, we will put them into practice. Many have no faith in God and have lost confidence in man, but they appreciate acts of sympathy and helpfulness as they see one with no inducement of earthly praise or compensation come into their homes ministering to the sick, feeding the, the hungry, clothing the naked, and so on. Uh, as they see this, their hearts are touched. Gratitude springs up. Faith is kindled. They see that God cares for them, and they are prepared to listen to his word as opened, as his word is opened. Christ commits to his followers an individual work, a work that cannot be done by proxy. It's amazing. We like to do things by proxy nowadays, don't we? But this work cannot be done by proxy. Ministry to the sick and the poor, the giving of the gospel to the lost, is not to be left to committees or organized charities. Individual responsibility, individual effort, personal sacrifice is the requirement of a gospel. There's some pretty um, powerful words in there for us to think about, aren't there? And we remember Jesus, uh, the parable that he told about the, the feast that was being put on and those that were invited didn't come. And then he finally instructed his followers to go out into the highways and the byways and uh, to compel them to come in and uh, that is our, our instruction today, to go out into the highways and byways. Um, and uh, if we remember some of the words that Kevin shared with us this morning in Sabbath school, um, then we will be willing to do that. Um, bring the poor that are cast out to thy house. When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him. Remember the, the, what Jesus said of the judgment it was parabolic, but um, uh, he says to the, to the sheep on his right hand, 
enter into the kingdom because you have come and visited me when I was sick. You came and ministered to me um, at other times. You visited me when I was in prison and so on. Uh, enter you in. And they said, when did we do that to you, Lord? He said, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. Every church member should be engaged in some line of service for the master. Some cannot do so much as others, but everyone should do his utmost to roll back the tide of disease and distress that is sweeping our world. Can we doubt that that is happening as we see what's going on around about us in the world today? <coughs> I'm just going to close this part of it with this statement from Ellen White. To everyone who offers himself to the Lord for service, withholding nothing is given power for the attainment of measureless results. For these, God will do great things. And, you know, we must um, accept God's promises. We must act upon them. And, uh, yeah, amazing things happen and continue to happen. I received a call a couple of days ago from Terry Adams, who some of you here know. He's not an Adventist, but he's a believer. He's been watching uh, 3ABN and First Light. He rang me, and this is a guy that has read the Great Controversy five times, and his copy has almost fallen to bits. He said to me, would I t go and take a copy of Great Controversy to a certain lady in Kamo who has a shop there? And so I did. Um, and I said to her, this is, a, this is a, uh, a gift from Terry Adams, even though I was actually giving it to her. And I also gave her um, a copy of um, uh, Creation Ministries magazine, which is amazing because Loretta had spoken to this lady before and she said she didn't believe in God, she believed in evolution. And so along with the great controversy, you know, and, and what amazing ways God reaches out to people who we can witness to. Christ's methods and Christ's methods alone. Now I'm going to ask uh, David and Lou if they would come up and um, we'll have a prayer for, the, for you, for everyone. So I'm going to ask as they get here for everyone to kneel and uh, we'll have that prayer season. You go first, Lou. Thanks. Reach out, Lord, to those we come in contact from day to day. And we just want to thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. And we just pray that you'll be with us as we move in our communities. And we just want to thank you, Lord, that the uh, 45 soldiers that have been held in Syria have promised to be released. And, Lord, we just want to thank you. And thank you again and pray that you will be with these individuals today. And again, we just pray that you'll bless us in all that we do in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father in heaven, this morning, Lord, we, um, we would ask you, Lord, for an awareness, an awareness of those around about us, of those in need, Lord, of those struggling, of those discouraged, Lord. And as we're called this morning to do as you did on this earth, Lord. The last message you had for us, in fact, we would ask that we notice outside our own realms, outside our own lives and families, those, Lord, who have need of you. 
This morning, Lord, I pray for all those here this morning with our heads bowed before you. Lord, sometimes we have great need and don't recognise it. Sometimes we have great need and do recognise it. Either way, this morning, Lord, I pray that you will have an impact on our hearts and our minds today. As we recognise who we are, where we are in time, and what you've called us to do. Lord, make that difference to us. Clear our hearts and our minds of those things that are disrupting thought from you this morning. Give Jan words to speak, Lord, that will impact our hearts and our minds. Make us more pliable, Lord. Make us more understanding. Make us recognise, Father, where we are again in time. Bless these people, Lord, before you. We are your followers. We are your children. We ask this morning for a special blessing and understanding of this mission that we have for you. In your name, amen. Thank you. Now, um, I just want to, you to turn your minds back a couple of hundred years or so, back to the early 1800s, early 1800s, um, prior to 1844. There was a great spiritual awakening in the United States, a spiritual awakening that was led by uh, William Miller, Charles Fitch, Joshua Himes, these were in different places too. They didn't all live in the same place. Josiah Litch, Joseph Bates and others. And they had all been studying the prophecies of the Bible. Especially the longest Bible prophecy, the prophecy of 2,300 days or years. And uh, they arrived at the conclusion, they believed it totally, that Jesus Christ would return on October 22, 1844. They, uh, prior to the date arriving, it was estimated that they had 100,000 followers. These were people who had come from many different churches who responded to the preaching of uh, these people, particularly of William Miller. And these people became known as the Millerites. And prior to the arrival of the, the uh, date on which they believed that Jesus would come, there was huge excitement. Um, people um, in many ways endeavouring to prepare themselves to meet the Lord. Uh, people um, gave away their property. One man um, who was a farmer had a, a crop of potatoes, which he didn't dig because he thought it was a waste because the Lord would be here and nobody would have any use for them. Um, many similar things. People just totally believed that Jesus Christ would come in October 22, 1844. However, the day came. Finally, they were little. They had a, a change of date. At first, they thought it was 1843, and then they realised they'd made a one-year mistake in their calculation and it was October 1844. The day passed, Jesus didn't come. And so they, they still continued to wait and to hope that he would come, but he didn't come. Uh, there was huge embarrassment for these people because um, they had, uh, many of them had been thrown out of the churches that they came from, uh, some of them from the Presbyterian church, uh, and others, they were, they were basically what we would today would call disfellowshipped because uh, their churches uh, didn't uh, have any knowledge of creation, of, uh, sorry, of, um, of prof prophecy. And uh, yeah, they, they just kicked them out, kicked them out of their membership. And um, so many people lost their faith totally as a result of the disappointment, the great disappointment um, however, what they had failed to realise was that, uh, that the, uh, the, the date that they had finally settled upon uh, was a correct date, but they had the, the event that was to happen there was incorrect. 
that that wasn't the date when Jesus to re was to return. And uh, so they uh, say many, many of them lost their faith totally. But a few uh, did not lose their faith. They continued to study the Bible deeply. And they studied them, their Bibles as never before as they endeavoured to establish what it was that actually happened on October 22, 1844. Ellen Harmon, as she was known then, was amongst that group. And I thank Andrea for the children's story. You gave us a wonderful introduction to what I, I want to say and the story about Ellen. Um, at, at this point in time, she was 17 years of age uh, due to the, the um, mishap or accident or whatever you call it um, of the, uh, what happened to her. She never had any education beyond the age of nine. Can you imagine that? Nine years, she had no more education when she endeavoured to go back to school after she recovered from the, or somewhat recovered from the disaster, she couldn't learn. And so they realised that it was no use her going to school anymore. <coughs> she was sick. She had uh, tuberculosis. She had heart failure and she was not expected to live more than a few months. The doctors had actually given her up totally. They expected that she would die very shortly. But in December of 1844, she received a vision and Kevin showed us a part of that vision in the Sabbath school a couple of weeks ago. And um, in that vision, uh, she saw a lot of, well, I'll tell you a little bit about the first of what she saw. She saw uh, in vision, she, she looked down upon the earth and she looked for the people of God and she couldn't find them. And then she was told to look a little higher. And as she looked a little higher, she saw this narrow pathway going upwards. It was very narrow. And the people that were on it had to be careful to keep their eyes fixed on the light above them, in front of them, or they would fall off into the darkness and be lost. Um, yeah, so she was, uh, Ellen White was actually told to share this vision with people. And this young lady who was sick, not expected to live, she could hardly speak. She couldn't hold a pen to write at that stage. She was very hesitant, but finally... Uh, she shared it with a few friends, and then um, uh, she was she was called to um, share her prophetic, prophetic vision, and she did so, and kept the congregation that she spoke to, or the group of people that she spoke to, spellbound for two hours. As she stood up to speak, her voice re, uh, it, it was amazing. People could hear her. And it's, that was an amazing fact of her ministry as she uh, was able to speak to huge um, audiences without, in fact, they didn't have uh, public address systems like we have today, and yet her voice was able, was able to carry over large distances and everybody heard clearly what she had to say. As she spoke to this group of people, for two hours, um, what she didn't know was that standing outside the um, building where she was speaking was a young man who stood at the door and listened and heard every word that she said. The next morning, there was a knock at the door and a young man asked to speak to Ellen Harmon. <coughs> he introduced himself as Hazen Foss, and told her that a few weeks earlier he had had the same vision but had stubbornly refused to tell it to others despite repeatedly being told, um, instructed by God to share it with others, he refused to. And so finally the Spirit of God came to him and told him that he had grieved away the Spirit of God and that uh, this, the gift would be taken and given to the weakest of the weak. 
and this was Ellen Harmon, who later became Ellen White. He cautioned her, he told her, to faithfully share what God had shown her, or as he was, she might be a lost soul. And I guess that that, that um, message coming from somebody else who had previously been given the gift would have impressed itself very deeply upon Ellen. And um, from then on, in most cases, she began, uh, she, she would faithfully share what the Lord had given her. So she began a 70 plus year ministry. Remember, she was 17 years old now, and she faithfully continued to minister to God's people um, in so many different ways. She um, was instructed to write down the visions and um, later on to, to um, write um, material for her husband to print and distribute. It's, it's a most fascinating story, actually, the, the um, beginnings of the work. In August of 1846, Ellen Harmon was married to James White, and she was henceforth to be known as Ellen G. White. She and James were incredibly poor in the things of this world. They had nothing. He was an itinerant preacher who had been one of the, the faithful souls um, at the time of the, the great disappointment. Um, he had no salary. Um, and Ellen, his wife, was just beginning her ministry, or her life, as a messenger of God. So at first they had nowhere to go and they lived with her parents uh, for some time until... Others uh, took pity on them and um, offered them a room in their home. And uh, it was uh, quite a number of years before they were able to um, have a home of their own. She does tell about when they moved into this room that James, her husband, uh, went off and he bought two bedsteads uh, for 75 cents for the pair and uh, he bought six chairs for which he paid the princely sum of um, 50 cents. Two of them had no seat on them, and so she had to actually make a seat to sit on. Um, it is amazing. Uh, we, we hear quite a lot about people today living um, in poverty. Um, yeah, and, and as you read about the life of, of Ellen and James White, you realise that uh, for many, many years they lived way below the poverty line. Now, there are, there are tests um, that the Bible gives us, or God has given us through the Bible, for a true prophet. And um, depending on who's actually um, giving the texts, the number can vary between 5 and 10. These are actually biblical scriptural tests for a prophet. And I'm going to read them to you, although I'm not actually going to read the text because we don't have time. Uh, so, a true prophet does not lie. His, his or her predictions will be fulfilled. And that's found in Jeremiah 28 and verse 9. A true prophet prophesies in the name of the Lord, not in his own name. 2 Peter 1.21 Number 3. A true prophet does not give his own private interpretation of prophecy. That's found in 2 Peter 1.20. A true prophet points out the sins and transgressions of the people against God. Isaiah 58.1. A true prophet is to warn the people of God's coming judgment. Two reference for that. Isaiah 24.20 20 and 21 and Revelation 14.6 and 7. A true prophet edifies the church, counsels and advises it in religious matters. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 3 and 4. A true prophet's words will be in absolute harmony with the words of the prophets who have preceded him. Absolute harmony. 
the text which um, I, uh, I know by heart and I counsel everyone here to know by heart Isaiah 8.20 to the law and to the testimony if they speak not according to this word it is because there is no light in them he recognises the incarnation of Jesus Christ 1 John 4 and verses 1 to 3 he can be recognised by the fruits of his work. Again, Matthew 17, 16 to 20 from Jesus himself. A true prophet acts in accordance with the will and approval of God and that's found from Deuteronomy 18 and verses 9 to 12. A question that some people had um, many people perhaps have why did God use a woman as a prophet in the end time the fact is of course that there were many women prophets in the Bible there was Miriam I'm only going to quote five but there are more than that Miriam the elder sister of Moses there was Deborah who was a judge of ancient Israel Huldah a prophet in the time of King Josiah. Noadiah, a woman who prophesied in the time of Nehemiah. Anna, a prophet who lived du during the days of King Herod. So uh, Kevin, this morning in, in the Sabbath school, he quoted from Joel 2.28. Um, and he did have it up on the screen, but it's not up there now, so I'm going to read it to you. Joel 2.28 says, And it shall come, up, come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men's, men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days a very um, valid prophecy for the time in which we live. Uh, the question that I asked myself as I continued to study on this topic, is that still valid today? Is that prophecy still valid today? Or um, was it only in the time of Ellen White? And uh, my answer to, the, to that is, that it is very much valid today. Um, and there are a number of instances. Um, Jeremy read a book which I uh, spoke about here, actually, I think, um, The Seventh Day Ox. Um, there are many, many other instances, and I, I suggest that people who watch regularly 3ABN could not doubt, but that Danny Shelton was given a vision from God, a vision, a dream, to build a television station that would reach the world with the three angels' messages and to counteract the counterfeit. That message, incidentally, had been given to at least two others that we know of previously without success. And so God gave it to a young man who knew absolutely nothing about television. He was a carpenter who had basically been home taught to build a house he knew nothing uh, but he did have faith and we today um, have the benefit of that ministry as we those of us that have the satellite um, ability to receive that also first light which we can receive within the metropolitan areas of New Zealand largely from from 3ABN and I believe that there are around the world that there are many other uh, happenings, miraculous happenings, where people in places where Christianity is not legal have had a dream where they saw a person. They saw, I've read this in the record on a couple of occasions, um, somebody in, um, in places where Christianity is not legal, a man had a dream and he saw someone with dressed in white clothing, bright white clothing, and told him to look for somebody who would tell him about Jesus. Is, the, is Joel 2.28 still valid today? 
I say yes it is. Now I want to share one or two of the more than, more than 2,000 visions and many miraculous events including healings and other amazing stories. And I'm going to ask Lou now if we could have the, um, uh, the second part of Ellen White's first vision. It's not, we don't have the vision, but we have a portrayal of it from um, 3ABN and the Pillars Project. Can we have that now, Lou? Thank you. For Marty Rice, and after the writing room was decided, I found out about Ellen White. I knew she was published, but I'd never read any Ellen White. I got online, and the first thing I discovered was her vision of heaven. I think she received the, uh, the vision, the prophecy, when she was 16 or 17 and wrote it down when she was 18. I was reading through, it was very poetic, and then two lines stuck out to me. She says, if I could talk in the language of Canaan, I could tell the story, could tell a little of the story of a better place. And I thought, this isn't the song yet? It's so beautiful. We don't know how to talk in the language of Canaan. She got a vision, she had a glimpse, she caught a glimpse, but it's not like here at all. It's not like Earth. The rules are different. We won't study more anymore, as the spiritual says. And so I wrote a song, The Language of Canaan. It, it's a wonderful song. We have uh, Susan Zorp, the wife of Dr. Zorp. You're going to be actually uh, playing, I don't want to say playing the part, but actually reciting the uh, Ellen White parts. And we thank you for that. We want to come on up here, and, and we just appreciate it so much. And David, this song, I have to say, when I heard this song, and, I, and I know Molly and Shelly, some of y'all over there, Jim, I mean, I actually cried when I heard this song. It was so beautiful, and I knew that God had had really used you, David, and you caught the vision. He said to me, no one could write this much good things about God and bring so much delight and not be a real prophet. And so he said, I want to do this song because I think even your young people may not realize and maybe you have lost the vision of who this lady is and what she means to this church and to the world. And so therefore, I want to do a song about the spirit of prophecy and this is resulted. <laughs> Come, come. 
come, my people. You have come out of great tribulation and done my will. Suffered for me. Come into suffering, for I myself will serve you. And we shall be, hallelujah, glory, and entered into the city. And I saw a table of pure silver. It was many miles in length, and yet our eyes could extend over it. I saw the fruit of the tree of life, the manna, almonds, figs, pomegranates, grapes, and many other kinds of fruits. And then Jesus said, You must go back to earth again and relate to others what I have revealed to you. And then an angel bore me gently down to the dark world. Sometimes I think I can stay here no longer. All things of earth look so dreary. I feel lonely here, for I have seen a better place, a better land. Oh, for ways like a dove, so that I... incidents to relate to you today, um, the very last of which was um, the health visions. But due to an occurrence that happened on um, Thursday evening as I checked my emails, uh, I have decided to make it the first one because um, there are so many amazing things that happened uh, back then that are revealed to us but also that have happened uh, this week. In, I'll come back to that. Um, in the um, visions, uh, she was shown much that was uh, roughly a hundred years ahead of science. She said things like, tobacco is a poison. It'll cause you cancer. She didn't, she didn't, this did not come from her own wisdom, from this lady who had had no education beyond nine years of age, uh, she talked about the dangers of alcohol, uh, the dangers of meat eating, um, that uh, she didn't have the terminology that we had, but she talked about germs from the, the meat which can be passed uh, through to human beings. And, you know, for many years this was not believed, actually. It, it's um, probably only very recently that this has actually come to, to be known as a fact. And um, Loretta and I had a very amazing illustration of this. We were in the UK in 1985 uh, for about six months or so, and, uh, and that was fine. We had a great look around the place. Now, 
Subsequent to that visit, um, uh, periodically in our country we have calls for donations of blood. And uh, each and every time, well, I don't do it anymore, but each and every time that I've gone to offer to donate blood, the only question they ask me is, were you in the UK in 1985? Yes, I was. Do you know what happened in 1985? There were a couple of things actually happened in 1985. The first one was that the French uh, terrorists came and sunk a ship in Auckland Harbour. The second thing was that while we were there, during the time we were there, there was a mad cow disease epidemic which happened in, in Britain during that time. And uh, now, because we were there during that time and potentially exposed to, uh, to that um, virus or whatever it is, I don't know enough about it, but it, it potentially has affected everyone who was in the UK during that period of time and uh, blood donations from us are not wanted. Um, these things can very obviously cross the species barrier. We can actually get diseases of many sorts from animals, not just from eating their flesh, um, but from um, dogs and cats and other so-called domestic animals. <clears throat> There's much, much more that she gave at this uh, last day church um, in, in guidance. And um, in the foyer, uh, I have put in Kevin's arranged for us some uh, books by Ellen White. For those, of, for those people who don't have any of her books, there's a number of different books there. There's only one on councils on diets and foods, which is the only one I could get at short notice. Um, there are several on Ministry of Healing, um, and I invite those who, who don't have any of these books to go through them and help yourself to them. That's what they're there for. I want um, our people to have access to the, um, the information that came from God to us today. Excuse me. <clears throat> and so uh, from the book The Early Years and this set of six volumes here is, is actually a biography not an autobiography it was written by her, great, her grandson Arthur White and um, I, this, these books come from my library but they are actually in the church library and it was where I first read them and um, I, anyone who wants to read them uh, absolutely fascinating reading, um, a reasonably exhaustive history of the ministry of Ellen White. And uh, this one I'm reading from is um, the early years. And so on uh, page 97, I open it up to where I have marked it. And um, Ellen White was instructed by God that she was to go to Portsmouth in the USA and that uh, she was to share there with them the information that God had given her. She had no money, nothing, broke, totally, as we'd say today. Um, they prayed about it, and uh, she decided that they would prepare to go. She was usually accompanied by her sister and uh, somebody else. <clears throat> and uh, so she tells the story. Uh, her sister Sarah and James White accompanied her and uh, she said uh, they were prepared to go. She had just put a bonnet on, which apparently they used to wear in those days. <laughs> and um, she said a, a uh, horse-drawn carriage came, drew up at the house at huge speed. A man hopped out and said, does anybody here need money? She said, yes, we do. Told the story. He said he gave them enough money to take them where they were going and to come back again. And uh, he said, hop in my carriage and I'll take you to the train. It was only four blocks away, but the train had already, or the cars as they called them back then, the first whistle had gone. They arrived, they hopped in the vehicle, uh, in the train, and the train took off immediately. And uh, God provided uh, for them when they went forward in faith. 
and you know we can just praise his name for that <coughs> oh yeah the man told them that his horses had galloped at incredible speed for 12 miles to reach the home where Ellen and James White were staying if anyone knows anything about horses a horse generally speaking cannot gallop at high speed for 12 miles it's not possible those horses were given uh, divine strength <clears throat> there are a number of others and I, I want to share some of them with you even though we are already past our time um, there was a story uh, relating to the period when Ellen White was um, invited, uh, requested to go to Australia. And there's much, many interesting stories about that. Um, one of them I will tell you. Um, it's quite an amazing um, incident. Uh, they, had, they decided that they would hold a camp meeting. It was the first camp meeting held by the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Australia, in Melbourne. And... Um, the um, town was uh, nothing like what it is today. There were, I'm not sure what the population was then, but they managed to gain use of a, a paddock within the city, about a 20-acre paddock, and they set up their, their camp meeting there. And the camp meeting was set up, much as we know camp meetings today, with a large tent and then the tents which the people were to stay in. There's a lot more to this than I'll have time to tell you, but... Um, yeah, the, the, there were larrikins there who were actually getting some fun from throwing stones at the tents, and um, uh, particularly while meetings were going on. And uh, on this um, particular occasion, uh, some of these larrikins uh, had obviously been listening to some of what they heard, and they realised that Ellen White was one of the main speakers there. And uh, so they decided that they, would, they were going to during the night that followed, they were going to collapse her tent on top of her. And uh, so this became known to the, to the folks who were running the camp. And uh, they, uh, feeling that they were unable to secure her safety, they decided to ask the police in Melbourne if they could provide protection for her. And uh, so the police sent down a large policeman, he was an Irishman and a Catholic, and uh, he patrolled in front of Ellen White's tent during part of the early part of the night. And um, of a sudden, he looked up and he saw an angel above her tent. Excuse me. He fell to his knees, crossed himself, and <laughs> worshipped the angel. And then he went back to the police station and he told them that he was not needed there. And um, that man subsequently returned to the meetings and, and uh, listened to what was being said and he later became a Seventh-day Adventist. Praise the Lord. There was an occasion um, in the early years from page 109, which I'll look at briefly, but I, um, I don't have time to tell you the whole story. But um, Ellen decided that uh, she needed to go and visit. And I don't know whether this was by inspiration or not, but there was a family who were living off the coast, a Hall family, and um, they were living on West Island. And so she uh, requested to be taken there to visit this family. And um, as they left, a tremendous storm came up. And uh, it seemed that they would be lost in, because uh, the small sailing boat that they were in was, was insufficient, inadequate to, um, to handle the storm that they were in. They were, they were actually on the point of... of uh, being lost in the in the storm ellen white was given she was taken in vision and uh, 
she was told that sooner would every drop of water on the planet be gone than that she could be drowned in that storm. <clears throat> the storm subsided and they, re they arrived at their destination and um, were able to visit with the people. <clears throat> There's another occasion um, back in the States. Uh, oh, incidentally, Ellen White was in Australia from 1891 to 1900. But in the States, um, she was uh, with her husband, James, about to take a train journey, and I've forgotten now exactly where they were going, but um, they went into a carriage and about to sit down, and she said, James, I cannot stay in this carriage. And uh, so they moved from that carriage back to the last carriage on the train. And as they progressed on their journey, um, had gone but a short distance, actually, um, there was a huge um, crash the um, carriages were jumping up and down, and um, yeah, what had happened actually was that um, a, a, an ox, as it described, had been laying on the on the railway line. The train had no cow catcher, as we would call it today, and um, so what happened was that um, that all of the carriages, except the very last one, were actually tipped up on end, one on top of the other, many people were killed. The carriage that James and Ellen White were in had been separated from the rest of the, rest of the train. The chain and hook, they said it could not have become unattached by itself. Um, the chain was neatly placed on the carriage in which they were in and they came to no harm. And praise God for that. <clears throat> um, on page 156 of the same volume, Ellen White in Vision was um, visited another planet. Now we have speculated, um, or we can speculate, whether in fact I, I notice on the internet that um, there's the scientists... Um, People who study this have been endeavouring to uh, find other planets that are capable of sustaining life, and we know that there are many of them. Um, she was taken to this planet, and as she arrived there, she noticed that everything seemed so much better, so much brighter, so much greener. And um, uh, Ellen White, incidentally, was always accompanied by an angel and um, I just diverged there for a second. Her son, Willie, who after James White's death, uh, Willie and his wife always accompanied, or usually accompanied Ellen on her journeys. And uh, he asked her, he said, Mother, when you have a dream at night, because during the early part of her ministry, she always uh, had, mostly had uh, public um, visions um, with various uh, physical characteristics that are mentioned in the Bible. Uh, she, he said, when you have a dream, how do you know that this is actually from God? She said, because the angel that attends me is always the same one. I know him. Yeah, so she uh, went to this planet. <coughs> she said she saw two trees. One looked much like the tree of life that she had seen in the city the city of God. The fruit of both, or she saw two trees actually, uh, the, fruit, the fruit of uh, them both looked beautiful, but of, of one they could not eat. And she actually asked why uh, things were so great there. And, and they said, because we have not eaten of the forbidden tree, the fruit from the forbidden tree. Her angel said to her, if any should eat, then they would fall. But they actually were very well aware of what was going on on earth. This is the interesting part about it. They said that uh, we have not fallen as did the people of the earth. 
And um, so amazing. While she was there, this really blew me away. While she was there, she met, she saw Enoch. She describes him as good old Enoch, and she talked to him. And uh, she asked him, is this the place that the Lord took you to? And he said, no, it is not. He said, my home is in the city, but I have come here to visit. And praise the Lord for that. She asked her attending angel if she could stay in that place. And he said, no, you have to go back and share what you have been shown. Now, the reason that I decided to share some of the health visions with you um, from Thursday night, as I uh, checked my email, there was actually a, um, one there which I get periodically from a Dr. Weil who um, speaks on health matters, and um, uh, he advocates various um, supplements that one can take to... to um, antioxidants and this sort of thing. Very good, some of them, because I know we use them. Um, but attached to that was um, a video clip, and it was entitled, A Church Group Who Live Longer Than Any Other Group in America, any other than the average in America. So I watched it. And uh, this man, a researcher, was being interviewed by um, a woman journalist, and... Um, she asked him about his research and uh, he said, he spoke about the people that live in Okinawa. Uh, apparently they have many there that live to be 100 years age, of age and um, spoke a little of their lifestyle. Apparently it's a very basic lifestyle. Uh, they, don't, um, they don't have much access to the uh, fast foods that uh, we have and so many of us use in this world and in this part of the world and um, so then she uh, asked him well what about this church group and he said well there's this group of people they're called the Seventh Day Adventists and um, uh, he said their diet is mainly plant-based diet uh, he said it's not to say that none of them don't eat meat but he said they don't eat much meat and um, uh, so they the people in, the, in this church uh, live on average 10 years longer than uh, the average American lives. And that's despite the fact that uh, not every Adventist is a vegetarian. He then went on to say that another aspect of the, uh, their increased uh, lifestyle, longevity, is their Sabbath. And this is what really amazed me. Um, as I considered what he had to say next, he said that they uh, keep the Sabbath, they don't work during the hours of the Sabbath, they spend the time in fellowship with one another, um, they don't attend to their businesses in any shape or form, or their, their uh, everyday work, um, they just keep that Sabbath and... and uh, you know, as I thought about it, I thought, what an amazing testimony. There's quite a lot more, which I can't recall all of it, but it, he, he placed large credence for the longer life of Seventh-day Adventists upon the fact that um, we keep the Sabbath and uh, the, of the benefits of that. And, you know, as I thought about that, my mind turned to um, Isaiah 58, I think it is. Let me have a look. And, you know, if you begin to read in 58 and verse 6, um, Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free? This is what we're reading in the Sabbath school lesson um, that Jesus was reading when um, in his own hometown. Um, and he goes on about the things that, um, that he wants to see, not the fast that the Jews were accustomed to, to using, a fast where they made a public display of the fact that they were fasting, but a fast that was used in helping other people. Um, 
in, um, yeah, it just goes on and on. It, in verse 8, then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily. And your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness shall be as the mid noonday. It goes on and talks more about the blessings. And then if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and I call the Sabbath a delight, the honourable day of the Lord, the holy day, and shall honour him not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high places of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Praise the Lord. What a blessing. What a blessing. And as I... Um, um, watched that video clip, read this, and then realized that today's uh, Sabbath school lesson was on the Sabbath. Today's week of prayer reading was from Ellen White. Um, it all just seemed to uh, coalesce together into one amazing blessing, for me anyway, and I hope for you. And it's my prayer that each one of you, as we uh, continue our Christian lives, that we will take these thoughts into, into our hearts, into our minds, accept the blessings that come to us from the ministry of Ellen White, the spirit of prophecy. I could have spoken a lot more with Bible texts, and there are plenty of them, um, pointing to the, the uh, presence of the uh, ministry of the Holy Spirit. At all times, God has had messengers to deliver his messages to his people. And we are so blessed, you know, that, um, that Ellen White was instructed by God to write, to write down what happened and record it. And this six-volume set here is just an absolute blessing. Um, it is in our library. I suggest that um, anyone that's interested start at the beginning and read your way through. It'll take you quite a while. I've read all of these, and um, I started off reading one or two from the library and then decided I needed to have the set myself, and um, it's a great blessing, but it's there for you, and much, much more. Um, we have um, a huge number of books. Ellen White wrote um, more than 25 million words in longhand. Um, many, many books were published. Um, during her lifetime and uh, continue to be published. She uh, was the, the woman whose writings were translated into more languages than any other woman who has ever lived. And um, we have this blessing, this ministry available to us all and I just pray that we'll each um, take advantage of it. All right, so our closing hymn today is... Shepherd Divine, it's number 192. Thank you.
announcement to make. Our Father in heaven, Lord, I just thank you for the wondrous ways in which you've blessed us with your word, with the spirit of prophecy, with the truths that were established so many years ago from your word. Thank you, Lord. Praise your holy name. And I just pray that you'll be with each one of us, Lord, as we go from this place. May we indeed be blessed. We do on the Sabbath day, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, Lou just uh, reminded me, which I had forgotten. Um, we received an email from Helen Eager uh, during the week um, with a, a plea for help uh, for the people in Nepal, uh, particularly the Bardi people. Um, it's, it's a very interesting group of people. These people aren't Adventists yet, some of them are, but um, they are actually suffering in um, absolute dire straits. And some of you will have, may have received an email along these lines sent to you, um, forwarded on to you. Um, the story was told not from Helen, but from one of the Asian aid people who was up in, in this particular community trying to minister to them. Uh, she said that uh, one man who was in great um, physical need because he had no work, they belonged to the, uh, the untouchables, and the same system applies in Nepal as it does in India, the untouchables, nobody will employ them, nobody will even allow them, most of the other people in the upper classes won't have them on their properties even, and uh, this particular man, he was so discouraged because he had nothing to feed his children with. He went out and tried to hang himself and um, he used his clothes to make a rope to hang himself with. But the, when they searched for him, they had searched for him for a long time to find him and they found him hanging from a tree and they cut him down and uh, it took about half an hour for them to revive him and they said, well, what did you do this for? Who's going to feed your family? And he said, well, it makes no difference. I can't feed them. I've got nothing. I've got no money. I've got nothing. And, um, you know, and so the, the, need, the call is that we um, next week take up a special offering. Um, Liz suggested that, and I, I agree totally, if, if uh, people that are willing to contribute put it in a tithe envelope and mark it uh, for Nepal, and then it will go as a, an offering from this church. And I know, I happen to know that this is happening in other churches too. Um, and uh, th they are in great need. And the, um, the Nepali person who wrote the email said, if we don't help them now, uh, when we come to them to talk to them about Jesus, they won't want to listen because we didn't help them. So we need to help them. So, yeah, I, I invite everyone to take up the privilege of ministering to these people next, next Sabbath. Thank you very much.